Thank you, Andrew, for coming on. Uh, I know you can't make it on Sunday morning. You've, you've got your daughter's university to deal with, um, which is great. Um, but I just wanted to, because we were in the uh, documentary, the Al Jazeera documentary, Labour Files. I just wanted to know what um, what bits you discovered from watching the documentary that you hadn't known before. Is there anything you picked up that you didn't know? Oh, there was a lot. Um, first of all, it's great to be back with you, Crispin. And sorry that I can't make Sunday. Um, I suppose the first thing is just the extent of the lawlessness um, in the Labour Party that is now under the leadership of a lawyer, weirdly. Um, the extent to which basic procedures, um, rules and regulations of governance are either just ignored when useful, um, invoked against certain factions and not others, how people are pilloried um, simply in what are factional battles within a political party. And I suppose specifically because I was um, interviewed for the anti-Semitism program, part two of, of the three-part series. And I suppose the thing that struck me most in regard to anti-Semitism besides the lawlessness was the fact that this is to such an extent a social media driven campaign. You know, this isn't about individuals or very few individuals, I should say, being treated in a discriminatory way. It's actually mainly about people focusing on other people's social media and searching through what must be hundreds of thousands of messages, looking for anything that might be interpreted or construed as anti-Semitism according to a very narrow definition. And the most astonishing thing is a lot of the people doing the complaining are actually non-Jews accusing Jews of anti-Semitism. Now, forgive me if, if I'm a bit dim, but fighting anti-Semitism by throwing Jewish people out of a political party seems to me slightly oxymoronic, I have to say. Um, and it's born, I suppose, of this belief that there are different types of Jews. And now I realize that it's mainly non-Jews who are deciding who are the good Jews and who are the bad Jews. And that has really, really shocked me. And in fact, I think it's in some ways turned on its head the whole notion of anti-Semitism, because I would argue, you know, I've, and I've said it on, on your program so often, I do not believe there is anything anti-Semitic about criticizing Israel. I do not believe that there is anything anti-Semitic about anti-Zionism. I think that people, many Jews, are very critical of Israel. Many Jews are anti-Zionist. And to suggest that all of those Jews are anti-Semitic would simply be a nonsense. It's people who have very reactionary political views labeling other Jews whose political views they don't like, and they're just giving them this label of anti-Semitism, which, which is obviously reprehensible, and it undermines the very real struggle against actual anti-Semitism. But in addition to that, you know, this notion, this assumption that underlines all of this is that all Jews must pledge allegiance in some way to Israel, and that all Jews are supportive of Israel, and that all Jews are uncritical of Israel, and that all Jews therefore hold the same views about Israel. And actually, that's really anti-Semitic, mm. because the Jewish community is like any other community. It's incredibly diverse. There are a huge spectrum of views on any issue. I mean, the one thing about Jewish communities that you can say is we're damn good at being argumentative. And it's part of Jewish culture and Jewish tradition and Jewish history. We argue about stuff and we love to argue about stuff and we disagree and we have differences. But now that has been weaponized by the Labour Party 
And I would think that it's actually been weaponized by a particular ideology. And I think that that is incredibly problematic. So that is the one overwhelming thing that I came away from the stuff on anti-Semitism that I saw. The second thing that I have to say is when watching programs one and three is I was really shocked at the extent and nature of Islamophobia and anti-black racism in Keir Starmer's Labour Party. And I think that this is a cause for very real concern, is the complete lack of care, the complete lack of concern that Keir Starmer has shown towards Muslim and black members of his own party who have been mistreated, who have been abused in the most awful ways, simply because they have more progressive politics than the leadership of the political party. Because this suggests that the leader of the Labour Party, despite being a lawyer, has very little regard for the rule of law. If he can't even run his own party according to its basic rules and regulations, how on earth is he going to run a country properly? He's going to be no better than Johnson or Truss who frankly, and excuse my language, but they don't give a shit about the rule of law, be it British domestic law or international law. And Keir Starmer has shown exactly the same instincts in the way he has operated internally within his party. But second of all, surely the Labour Party, supposedly a democratic socialist party, supposedly a party of the left, should be at the forefront of anti-racism. And, you know, as Mandela used to say to us, you are either against every form of racism or you are part of the racism problem. And right now, what those programs have shown us is that Keir Starmer's Labour Party is part of the racism problem in this country. All right. Now, what I mean, just hearing what you've said, um, I was, I'm, I'm, there is another question which is quite big in my mind, which is uh, why are the media not covering this uh, documentary? And is it in any way linked, do you think, to the anti-Semitism issue? Do you think that they are scared to cover that? Um, do you think that they're influenced not to cover that? I mean, is that the main reason, do you think, they won't cover this documentary? I think it's a subsidiary reason, and I'll come back to why in a moment. I think the main reason that they've pretended these documentaries were never made is because the mainstream media they're either so nuts that they would continue to support the Conservative Party, which has shown itself to be totally incapable of running this country. And it's shown itself to be that for the last four years. You know, to have a clown like Boris Johnson as prime minister, to be replaced by somebody as economically illiterate and incompetent as Liz Truss, who has managed in the space of just a few days to crash the British economy. I mean, I think, the mainstream and the establishment media are now realizing that the Tories are something of a busted flush. And I think what they've concluded is that Keir Starmer is a very safe pair of reactionary hands that the establishment can be very comfortable with. And therefore, I think the reason that they have pretended that these thousands and thousands of documents which give evidence of massive abuses within the Labour Party, of criminality within the Labour Party, of abuse of power amongst the leadership of the Labour Party. The reason they've ignored that is because they don't want to jeopardize the prospects of Keir Starmer becoming the next prime minister of this country, because I think they feel, and probably correctly, that it'll lead to very little, if any, change. I, I mean, think this what they hope, is that a Keir Starmer government would run the country slightly more efficiently and effectively than the last four years of Tory governments, but will actually keep the inequalities, the entrenched privileges that they all benefit from, that he will keep those in place. And I think they're probably right. So that sort of shows the difference between how the media jumped on the Panorama documentary, but um, because they obviously didn't like Corbyn's politics but they haven't jumped on 
the Al Jazeera documentary it, it, because they have a kind of preference for who they want as the opposition or as the possible next prime minister? You know, the media is a part of the British establishment. We have seen over and over again, even The Guardian, which is probably as, as left as the mainstream media gets, have become an intrinsic part of the establishment. And we saw that particularly in relation to their attitude to Jeremy Corbyn, not Jeremy Corbyn as an individual, but Jeremy Corbyn for what he represented politically. Because what did he represent? He represented a very real threat to the establishment. Rather than giving tax cuts to the richest in our society, a Corbyn government would be significantly increasing the taxes, especially on the super wealthy in the society and on corporations and making them pay their way. And, you know, a lot of the people who run the media today, who are the opinion formers in the media, are doing extremely well materially out of the current situation, and they don't want that to change. Also, it's about a corporatized vision of the world, a vision of the world in which business and politics have become completely intertwined and inseparable, in which we live in, as Greg Pallas, the American journalist says, we live in the best democracy money can buy. And sure right. as hell, it's bought our democracy. And I think that's the overwhelming reason. The other part of the equation, and this is where it connects to the anti-Semitism stuff, is that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-imperialist and an internationalist. So that means he wouldn't allow Britain to go to war every time the United States of America rings our bell and tells us that there's a war to fight. He wouldn't allow us to sell billions and billions of pounds to Saudi Arabia and the UAE to keep those despicable human rights abusing authoritarian regimes in power and facilitating and enabling them murdering tens of thousands of innocent civilians in Yemen, which they've done with the aid of Britain, the US and European countries since March of 2015. All of that would have to stop. And we need to understand that the arms trade is incredibly profitable, not just for the companies and individuals involved in it, but also crucially for political parties. The arms trade, which accounts for 40% of all corruption in all global trade, is an absolutely key financier of our major political parties and our political system as it functions. Look at someone like Tony Blair, who within weeks of leaving office starts earning tens of millions of pounds from the very interests he's served, be it BAE Systems, who he has helped pay bribes all over the world, including in my own country, South Africa, undermining the democracy in those countries, be it the invasion of Iraq, from which he directly has earned tens of millions of pounds. So, Jeremy Corbyn's anti-imperialism was a very real material threat, or is a very real material threat, to mm. the establishment and to the way it reproduces itself and enriches itself. So they could not allow him to become prime minister. Now the Labour Party's safe again. They have an establishment figure in Keir Starmer who will go to war, who will allow our arms trade to flourish in violation of international law who will brook no criticism of Israel, which along with countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE is amongst the most abusive regimes in terms of human rights, is engaged not only in the practice of apartheid, but in a brutal illegal occupation. But if we say that, regardless of our credentials in fighting anti-Semitism for decades and decades of experiencing anti-Semitism long before most of the non-Jews who now accuse Jews of being anti-Semitic even knew what anti-Semitism was. The reason for that is both to protect the establishment and to protect Israel from criticism. I mean, do you think Starmer would row back the Tories' attempts to make support for boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel? Could you see a Starmer government actually saying, no, no, people have the right to support BDS? Of course he wouldn't. He has said, what did he call himself? An uncritical Zionist or a, a Zionist without doubts? 
I mean, tell that to the family of the seven-year-old child who died in Palestine yesterday after being chased by the Israeli military, a seven-year-old child. Tell that to the people who live a daily hell every day in the occupied Palestinian territories. And this is the Labour Party. This is the Democratic Socialist Party. Yeah. This is a party whose which was founded by the trade unions, whose leader now won't let his front bench support striking workers on the picket lines in Britain's worst cost of living crisis in decades and decades and decades. Now I've got so a, that's uh, why we have yeah. the situation that we have. And that is what the Labour files exposed on Al Jazeera. And that is why the mainstream media playing their role as a support to the British establishment have completely ignored those documentaries. And unfortunately, it is that sort of abrogation of responsibility by the media that has led this country to have prime ministers as bad as Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and perhaps in the future, Keir Starmer. It is because the media have not been doing their job, which is to hold power to account. 